All right, let's make some noise for the Lord, huh? All right, show of hands. Show of hands, you ready? How many of you would say that you are competitive? Okay, why are y'all laughing? Well, I, I, that wasn't a joke. Let, let, let's try it again, though, okay? Let, how many of you would say that you're competitive? Yeah. All right, ha, 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 I beat y'all. I beat y'all. Now, listen, if you're here and you're not competitive, you may not get this. The reason why I asked that a second time is so that all of us who were competitive could be like, um, yeah, I beat that person, and I beat my hand went up before him, and my hand went up before... I think that one got me. I think that one got me. All right, let's try it one more time. All right, on the count of three, on the count of three, the count of three, how many of you are competitive? One, two, three. <laughs> I still beat you. <laughs> and all of you who are hyper competitive are like, no, 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 you cheated. For sure you cheated. All right, we'll come back to that a little bit later. First of all, let me just stop and say, good morning, Harvest. <laughs> Welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, North Iowa. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we really are thankful that you're here to, to worship our Lord and Savior with us. Um, for all of our visitors, my name is Pastor Terry, and uh, if, if you are a visitor, please, after the show, I would love for you to come up and, after the show. Did you catch that? After the show, because I feel like a dancing monkey up here right now. Let's just stop and pray. Here shortly, um, we'll get to our actual message. But uh, if you are a visitor, would you please come up and introduce yourself afterwards? I would love to get a chance to, uh, to meet you. Uh, if you're online, you can leave your comments in our live feed. Uh, I'd love to get a chance to meet you any way that, that we can. We are thankful that you're here. So, okay. Whew. You ready? All right. We are continuing on in a series that we started Towards the beginning of the year, the series is called God of More. And the reason why everybody knows that is because our theme this year is the God of Right. That theme is right out of Ephesians 3.20, which will pop up right here, which says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all... Did you see the word more? Far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that is work, at work within us. So this year, we have been excited to see God do more here at Harvest and in the lives of, of our people here at Harvest. We want to see more people coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, more people having forgiveness of sins, more people being baptized, more people having victory over sin and death and anxiety and depression and all of it. We want to see God do more. Amen? We're not talking about more... Um, Sports cars in the parking lot or more bigger houses or that type of stuff. We're talking about God doing something spiritually in us, through us, in our church, and through our church. And so that's what we've been praying for all year. I hope you're still joining us in prayer with, uh, uh, joining in prayer with us uh, for that theme this year. So um, as we move forward, we're talking today about God of more, more you specifically. So we're talking this year um, about spreading the, the series over the whole year, right? So our theme, God of More, we're spreading it out over the whole year so that we're not just getting it all at the beginning of the year. Um, we're spreading it out every once, once, maybe every month, something to that effect. So you'll get one maybe next month, and we're going to keep doing that so that this continues to be in your head, in your heart, in your mind. And again, today, we're talking about God of more, more you. So let's do what we do every week, and let's open up our, right, we're in Hebrews chapter 10 today. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to read through verses 19 through 25. As our main point for the day pops up here, we're going to see that God wants to do more with you, in you, and through you. Keep that in mind as we read through this. Okay? Verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, 
And since we have a, a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the, conf the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Okay, so God is a God of more. And God wants to do more with you, in you, and through you. Amen? Now listen, um, as I say God is for you, I really want to be clear what I'm talking about. Okay? When I, God is a God of more, God is for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is for you? I mean, that's kind of a common thing that's almost like church lingo these days. But do you really believe it? Do you really believe it? God is a God of more. And when I say God is a God of more for you, I'm, I'm not talking like God is a God of more for you as in he's some genie, right? But instead of rubbing a lamp, you rub the Bible and God pops out and grants all your wishes. And then he goes back into the Bible until you want more wishes to be granted. That's not what I'm talking about when I say God is a God for you. What I do mean is that God is for you. God is for your good. Romans 8 says that all things work together for the good of those who are in Christ Jesus and called according to his purpose. 2 Peter 3 says that God wishes that none shall perish. Um, Holly referenced verse in John earlier that said God came, he, Jesus came, he came so that we would have life and life to the fullest. God is a God of more, and God is for you. Not like some spoiled um, child. I was going to say um, spoiled only child, but there's probably some of you that are only children in here, and your spouses are looking at you, and they're saying that's you. They're giving you that elbow already. I don't want to double down on that. But that's, that's not the point. That's not what we're talking about. God is a God of, who is for you. He is for your good. And today, we're going to look specifically at three ways that God is for you. Before we do that, I think after our intro today, we really need to go before the Lord in prayer, don't you? <laughs> Let's ask him to help us in this. Father God, uh, thank you so much. We are here to worship you, to praise you, to make much of your name and no one else's. Today is about you. Thank you for your word and for how you teach and train us, Lord. Uh, we ask, almost every week we ask this, that you would open up our hearts, that your spirit would work in us to teach us and to train us as we walk through your word, and we do it for your glory. Help us as we do this today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so God is a God of more, and he wants to do more with you, in you, and through you. So we're going to take a look at these three ways that God is for you. If you're ready, say ready. All right, here's number one. Number one, God is a God of more, and he is for doing more with you. I want you to look back at our text. Look at verses 19 and 20. It says this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, we move on to let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Okay, I want to go back a little bit because it's really important that we understand the picture that the author is giving us here, okay? The picture here is the picture of the temple. So in Jerusalem at the time that this was written, uh, there was the temple of God. The temple was the place where people would go to worship God. Okay? They would make sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins, although that was just a covering, right? Couldn't completely forgive their sin. It was just kind of a covering of their sin at the time. But they would come, and this is where they would worship. But there were some really unique things about the temple that's really important to know. Okay? So the temple was primarily for the Jews. Okay? So this was um, a building that had different layers, different kind of levels of access to it. 
So the outer courts was the area that um, any, anyone could go, including people who were non-Jews. They, they, could, they could go to the outer courts, but they couldn't go any further into the temple. And then the, the next level of access was the, the area that um, anybody could go through, but the Jewish, except any Jew could go through, but the Jewish women, like they had to stop there. Okay? So the Jewish women could only kind of go into that first level. And then the next level was the level that was for like all the Jewish men. Okay? So uh, all the Jewish men could go in there. They could worship uh, and, you know, have their, their time, of, time with God there. But then there was a, a final area. And this area was called the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was where uh, the Spirit of God was. And so also uh, we had in there the, the ark with the, the Ten Commandments, all of that. Okay, I'm giving you, I know we're diving a little bit deeper here. But so this was an area that God's presence was right there. And we only had access to, well, I shouldn't even say we. One person had access to that area once a year. It was such a big deal that only one person would have access to that. It was the, one of the priests, and it was such an amazing situation. The presence of God being there was so important that when the priest would go in there, they would, like, tie a rope around him. So in case they heard a, they knew he had just dropped over dead, and they were, like, pulling him out. That was how intense it was to be able to go in to the presence of God. Okay? Does that make sense? So, along comes this man. I hope you heard of him. He was man, but God at the same time. His name was Jesus, and Jesus was the Christ. He was the, the Christ that the prophets had been prophesying for hundreds or thousands of years. He finally comes into the world. We talked last week, we talked at Easter about how he came and he gave his life. He sacrificed his own life on the cross to pay the price for our sins. He was that sacrifice, okay? When he did that, something amazing happened. Okay, so I want to point out a couple things here. So when our text here talks about entering the holy places, that's a reference to like that holy of holies, okay? That's what it's talking about here. But, but remember, only one person can do that once a year. So how could he be telling us that we should have confidence to be able to enter such a place. Well, he goes on to explain. It's by the blood of Jesus. It's by the new and living way that he opened for us. So in other words, when Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross, something really cool happened. See, at the Holy of Holies, if you were there, there was a huge curtain that was in front of it. It separated people from that level of access to God's presence. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, what happened? The curtain or the veil, it was torn. Not figuratively. It was literally torn. And it was torn not from bottom to top, right? I mean, this, was, this wasn't like the curtains you have on your windows at home. Hey, this was a big, huge curtain. So if a man had done it, maybe they would like cut it and try pulling it from the bottom. Or like multiple people. But that's not what the scripture tells us. The scripture tells us that the, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. Meaning, God himself provided us that access, a constant, constant access to the, access to the presence of God by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. Yeah, that was... I mean, I'm, I appreciate the amens, but if we're going to do it, let's do it. God made it possible for us to have access, constant, direct access to him through his son, Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross. Amen? And not just the Jews. All of us, all who would turn and put their faith in Jesus Christ. See, God made it possible. In fact, Romans 5 says, um, since we have been justified through faith in Jesus Christ, we now have access to God. This access, it comes only by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that was opened for us through the curtain, 
And that is through his flesh. His flesh and his sacrifice was the tearing of the veil that separated us from access to God. And so we now have that access to God. And guys, God is a a God of doing more with you. And I'm not talking about like hanging out and watching your favorite sitcom. He's there, amen? Wherever we are, God is omnipresent. He is everywhere with us. But I'm talking, he actually wants your time. He wants to grow that relationship with you. And that access only comes when we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's the time that we call out to Jesus. We confess that we're sinners who needs a Savior. We can't do it on our own. We put our faith in Jesus' work, his death and burial and resurrection, that time of the cross as the forgiveness for our sins. And then we just ask, Lord, help us the the best way we can to live for you because we can only do it with his strength. That's the only way that, that, that we get that access to the, the presence of God. And that's why it says, enter. Enter. And then the next slide, when it comes back up again, boom. Let us draw near. He is sacrificed so that we can have that access to him. No more treating our time with him like a, a teenager who only wants to be around his parents when they come for money or a ride somewhere. Right? Or can I borrow the car? No, you can't borrow the car. I didn't know you still lived here. You've been buried in the basement. Like, what have you been eating? Please. James chapter 4 says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Please make spending time with God a priority. I, I, does it sound like I was begging there? Because if it did, like, that was good. I, I don't know how. I mean, I don't, I don't know how to, to make this like more of a plea to you. I could maybe take a knee. I, I don't know. Please make spending time with God a priority. If you do, it will change your life. If you don't believe me, try me. Test me on it. Spending time with God. Listen, God has made it available for you to come into his presence. He's given you his scripture that you can know him, that you can know what he desires for you and what his plans are. We, uh, we started men's and women's Saturday morning groups back up again. That's been great. Our women's group started off with how to study the Bible. Our men's group, our first two sessions, is prayer and Bible study. Do you catch a clue? Guys, if we all made spending time with God a priority, we could change the world. And I don't mean for us. I mean, we could impact the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. So please make spending time with God a, a priority. All right, so number one is he's a God of more, and he's for doing more with you. Here's number two. He's a God of more, and he's for doing more in you. All right, let's look back at our text. Verse 22 through 23. More in you. Here's our text. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who prompt, this is gonna be a good place for an amen. For he who promised is faithful. Nice. All right. So God is a more, God a more, and he is for doing more in you. And listen, it's important again that we get the picture of what our author is kind of presenting here. Okay? So let's go back to the temple. I told you that um, it was such a big deal that the priest would get to go into the presence of God, um, that they would tie a rope around him, right? So that if he fell over dead, um, he, they could pull him out. The idea was that um, someone who would go into the presence of God had better come in prepared. They had better taken the opportunity to prepare their hearts and even their bodies at the time. In fact, um, have you ever seen uh, like a doctor show? Um, Every time a doctor like goes into surgery, what, what do they do? They're like scrubbing like crazy, right? Maybe you've seen this in person. So you kind of always seen the, the scene where they're there with their um, arms all soaped up and they're scrubbing and cleaning like crazy before they go into surgery. 
It's the same idea. The priests at the time, before they would come into the presence of God, or even before they would have the opportunity to, um, to be able to offer sacrifices, they were supposed to clean their hearts with their own sacrifice and even wash their bodies. That's how holy and righteous of a thing it was. And so that's the picture that we're seeing here with our hearts sprinkled clean. This sprinkled clean, by the way, um, that does not refer to baptism, okay? <laughs> there is no mandate for sprinkling for baptism in the Bible, okay? That's not what that's talking about. It's just that God wants to make our hearts clean and he will eliminate an evil conscience and he'll wash away with pure water our sins. That's what it's referring to. See, God is a God of more for you. God is for you. God wants to, to wash us clean. Say us. That means you. Say me. God wants to wash you clean from your sin and the eternal consequences of your sin. Now listen, um, we probably haven't said this for a while, but choose to sin, choose to, choose to sin, choose to suffer. So that doesn't mean that you won't still deal with the consequences of sin. Right? We make bad mistakes in this life, and there's consequences for that. Right? Um, in our family, we would say um, <laughs> choices have consequences. Right? So you might still, but God wants to wash you clean for the, from the eternal consequences of your sin. And as he does so, he wants to wash your conscience clean from all of that past shame, past guilt, past whatever, from all of the stupid, dumb mistakes that we have made. And y'all, I've got a lot of them. How about you? Right? My wife's not in here right now. It's probably pretty good. Ava thought that was hilarious. I have a lot of them. Listen to me. Guilt is a good thing when you have not confessed your sin to Christ. Guilt and shame are terrible when you have confessed your sin to Jesus Christ. Do you get the difference there? Listen, if you've got sin in your life, in fact, um, if you've got a check in your spirit when you go home today, I would say go before the Lord, ask him to reveal your heart, and if there is any sin in you, go before him and confess that sin. And then when you do, move on, y'all. Get to living Get focused on how you can glorify him. Listen, God wants to wash. The scriptures are very clear that God puts a conscience in us. That's how we really know good from evil. And when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he wants to cleanse us from all of that guilt, all of that shame, and he wants to put some life in our life. He wants us to focus on him. That's what he wants to do in us so that he can do more through us, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. And again, this change, this change in us is only possible because of our confession. It's because of our confession of our sin and our confession of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That is our hope. Our hope that no matter how bad this world gets, and guys, it can get bad sometimes, can't it? No matter how bad it gets, no matter how good it is, it's going to get better. The end is going to be better than the beginning. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and the promises that we have with him. Please, please make spending time with God a priority because he will be faithful. He will be faithful to do a work in you. He has a desire that you would be more like his son that you would have that heart. And if you will spend time with him, then he will be faithful to do a work in you. God is a God of more, more you. He is for doing more with you, he's for doing more in you, and he's for doing more through you. That's number three. So if you're still with me, say with you. Okay, let's move on a little bit. God wants to do a work through you to love and serve people. Look at this. Look back at the text. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day coming. God wants to do more through you. 
He wants to do more through you to love people and for good works. Now let's, let's, let's break these down. Let's start with love. Listen, our mission here at Harvest Bible Chapel is, is what? It's to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ who love and love people. Love is the original command. Love is the summary of all of the commandments that Moses gave. The Ten Commandments, the first four are love God. The rest of them are love people. This is the original commandment that he has. And God wants to work through you to spread more love to the world, to show the love of Jesus Christ, to, not to just say you love people, but to actually love people, to actually do something about loving people. And not only that, he wants, us, he wants to use us for good works. Now listen, in the church we talk about good works and all of a sudden, uh-oh, we're talking about salvation by works and we're going to start getting too religious here and we're going we're to start talking about rules and all that stuff. No, no, listen. God wants your heart. And as he has your heart, he's got some things for you to do. Did you hear me? He's got some things for you to do. I'm not just talking about me. I'm not just talking about our elders. God wants to use you to spread the good news of his son Jesus Christ to the world, and that is an honor. He could have done it any way he wanted to. He could have wrote it in the sky. He could have sent angels, but he chose you. He chose you to spread the good news of his son, the good news of forgiveness of sin, he chose you to love and serve people. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not of works. It's not of your own doing as if you could earn it on your own. It's a gift of God. Then he goes on to say this, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Did you catch that last part? For good works. I asked y'all earlier. I said, uh, okay, you ready? Show of hands. Are you competitive? Ooh, I don't know. Jonah might have got me. It's possible. The scripture says that we are to stir up one another to love and good works. We're supposed to be stirring up one another to love and good works. That's actually not a competition. Right? I know you probably thought I was going to like encourage a competition there. It's really not, really not a competition as much as a, I want everything to be a competition, but it's really not. It's God getting our heart so that out of our love for him, we are stirring one another on to more love and to serving him more. It's that important. That's why it goes on to say, we should not neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another. We're not supposed to give up meeting together because when we come together, not only are we coming for the purpose of glorifying God, amen? But we're coming so that we can encourage each other and stir each other up to loving people more. Yes, loving each other, but loving people that are out in the world, even the difficult ones. And, uh, and stirring each other on to good works. I saw something on social media um, this week. And of course, if it's on social media, it's solid. But I saw something on social media. It said, um, <laughs> you shouldn't be coming up with an excuse for missing church. Church should be your excuse for missing anything else. In other words, it's got to be a priority for us. Hasn't he earned it? Ha he gave us the availability to come directly into his presence, to have access to him, to know his desires for our life, to have the forgiveness of sins. And he deserves us coming to him so that he can work and change us and then use us to love people and to do good works, to serve others, to spread the gospel, to... Uh, let's start easy. Who'd you invite to church this week? How have you been loving on your neighbors? How have you been loving on your family? God is for you. 
and he's for doing more with you, in you, and through you. Please, please make time with God a priority. He is faithful to work in you so that he can better work through you. And I know I said it's not a competition, and it's not. But keep in mind that Matthew chapter 6 that says that you should lay up treasures for yourself in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy. Lay up treasures for yourself in heaven. That means that we need to live our life with an eternal concept. Constantly thinking about eternity, not just our time here. And guys, there's only one thing that's eternal on this earth. You want to lay up treasures for yourself? Invest in something that's eternal, and that's people. People are what's eternal. It's right here, y'all. If, you are, if we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we are going to exist together for the rest of eternity. Amen? So this is what we should invest in. Please, please take that time. As our worship team comes forward, I want to leave you with a, a pretty simple challenge for this week. God is a God of more. And God is for you. He wants to, he wants to do more in, with you, in you, and through you. So this week, I just want you to take a time, take some time, um, every day. Every day, I want you to spend some time with the Lord. Prayer, scripture, every day. Start, start easy. You don't have to start with an hour. Maybe it's just 15 minutes. I dare you to do it. Listen, guys, it's kind of like um, the potato chip commercial. You can't eat just one. I dare you to try to just do 10 minutes. Right? Just start there. See if you can just do 10 minutes or if you don't look up at the clock and realize it's 20 minutes or a half hour. Every day this week, spend some time with the Lord. And he will work in you so that he can work through you. He is faithful. If you're here and you have not given your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, can I, can I just say we're thankful? Whether you're joining us online or here in person, we're glad that you're here. Church? Amen? Let's just do that for now. From now on, when I say, hey, we're thankful that, that you're here to join us, and I say church, amen. Because we want to show love to everybody. No matter what, how you came in here today, you came in broken, hurting, whatever you have in your conscience, whatever you're focused on, wherever you are in life, we're glad that you're here. And if you're here and you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, I pray that you would not leave here today without coming up and seeing me or grabbing the person that brought you. Grab somebody who's close to you because today could be the day that you have forgiveness of sins, that you have access to the God who created you, to the God who created this world, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, who is a loving God. He's not, he's not a father like fathers in this world. Even the best of fathers don't compare to the love that our Father has for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of the cross. Thank you that you have given us access, that you would allow us to come before you even now to to ask that you would bless us, to ask that you would work in us and work through us, Lord. Give us a heart and a passion for spreading the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, work in us and work through us so that we can make much of your name. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.